This place is really a Garden of Eden. We are just stewards here and we are trying to take the best care that we can of this lovely environment. The landscape is great as it is, but just make it so you can actually live in it. And then you build a little hut where you can have a fridge, you can have a shower. So you're not changing the place you're going to, you're just making it comfortable to live in its simplicity. So each country, each island is totally unique. You have diversity of language, diversity of food, diversity of habitats. That's one of the things that makes the Caribbean so attractive to have visitors. So I think we need a diversity of approaches to tourism. Anybody that is interested in the green movement should absolutely step up to the plate. The, the benefits are incredible for the customer, for the, for the associate, for the uh, business owner and for the environment, for nature. The Caribbean is the most tourism-dependent region in the world. In 2015, some 25 million cruise passengers and over 20 million overnight tourists visited the Caribbean. But industrial-scale mass tourism often brings few benefits to the island's people. This film portrays a different type of sun and sand Caribbean tourism. Innovative, green alternatives that protect and sustain the environment and respect and benefit local communities while offering unique and superior vacation experiences. The Caribbean provides many such travel alternatives. Here we feature examples from four islands. Jamaica, Dominican Republic, Grenada and Aruba. They illustrate both environmental stewardship and community benefits. And they show how responsible travel choices do make a difference for businesses, travellers, the environment and for the welfare of the Caribbean islands and their people. If we don't have beach and our beaches are created by our coral reefs and primarily by the species that inhabit them, then we don't have clients. If we don't have clients and we don't have hotels. We have a hard time getting homeowners to invest here. Um, and so environmental protection becomes a key component of our business. You know, our beaches are one of our most valuable assets. And if we're not investing to protect that asset, then we're not protecting our own business. And so I think that's one of the ways we look at it. The stuff we're doing on coral reef restoration, um, we've worked for over 10 years now doing coral reef first protection and then monitoring, but also now we're doing active restoration. And we have partners from University of Miami, from Counterpart International, and now we've built a network of different institutions in the Dominican Republic that are doing restoration work. Punta Cana actually does uh, the most active restoration in the Caribbean. And just last year alone, we placed over three linear kilometers of coral tissue back onto our reefs. Underwater in our aquarium, we have a diving circuit marked with rope. The tourists that do the diving follow a set path so as they don't kick all that sand on the corals we are trying to restore. Our aquarium is the place where we have our underwater nursery. We have the second largest nursery in the Caribbean. We develop guidelines that the boat owners and tour operators should follow so we avoid that the boats anchor indiscriminately on the reef. The only ones that are allowed to fish here are the local fishermen. We work with the fishermen to give them opportunities to create alternative income sources for their families, such as working with us catching the lionfish and working with us on the coral restoration and working with us managing lobster shelters and small fish fry shelters so as to have enough fish on the reef for the future generations. It's very rare that we cut down trees. I think what it is that people like about GoldenEye, honestly, is because we have all these trees. All these trees right next to the sea. You don't normally have it. If you're staying 
right next to the sea, you're surrounded by concrete, you're surrounded by trees. And most people live in cities far away away from natural life, natural organic life. And I think that what I want to try and do is sort of offer that. It's something you feel. You might not even see it, you might not even recognize it, but you feel it. I like things to be more kind of natural. So, you know, we have to warn people that all the paths are not even in there not railings on the steps and things like that because I think the more you do all that the more you move away from the authenticity. It's not just a beach, it's an incredible mixture of people. An incredibly blessed um, island in terms of its soil and its, uh, its um, flora and fauna and everything else like that. It's, um, it's an ama amazing island. My approach is to try and give people a, a base when they arrive to come and base themselves here or in other uh, properties or any similar type of properties and come with the idea of exploring Jamaica, not just of staying in a hotel for the whole week that they're here or 10 days or whatever and never leave the hotel. That is the, that is the worst thing, that's a tragic thing to do if you're coming to Jamaica. You have to get out, get about and see what Jamaica has to offer. We, as a, as a resort, really have uh, tried to keep pace with technology because uh, energy is an extremely costly uh, um, product here on the island. Water is extremely uh, costly and electricity is extremely costly. We have a couple of uh, VRF cooling towers right here that um, will save you, if used properly, about 25 to 30 percent and compared to the conventional cooling towers for hospitality buildings, you'll see we have uh, more solar um, thermal heating water panels. Uh, so this is actually provides hot water to the, all the guest rooms. And we have these panels on this roof, but we also have them on the Tara roof, which is our other building. But then we also have them for our guest laundries and our in-house laundry as well. What is the role of uh, the whole kind of certification process? Why do you go through it? It really helps a hotelier as a guideline, as a roadmap or a schedule of things that need to be done so that it's done properly to achieve a total um, environmental program. We call this our iguana habitat actually. Um, it's one of the sections that we have on property that, that have uh, native or indigenous uh, plants. They use a lot less water, they're used to this type of climate, um, so it's better for the environment all around. The lawns that we have, uh, these are all watered by grey water. So we actually collect um, grey water, so all of the water runoff from our washing machines in our laundry room, um, all of the water runoff from the showers and the sinks, uh, this is all collected into a grey water pit uh, on property, and we use that water to irrigate all of our gardens and lawn here on the property. So here we are at the Elements restaurant. I'm currently standing in one of our lounge areas. It's all made out of 100% uh, recycled plastic and recycled materials. Now it doesn't only stop here at the furniture. If you look at the deck that we have here, this gray deck, which is called Trex deck, it's actually made out of 100% recycled plastic and wood. And we have this throughout the whole deck of the restaurant, as you can see, also by the bar and also by the pool area as well. On the beaches, we have recycling containers in several areas, and these are actually throughout the whole property. So we actually are giving the guests the option to recycle. Let's go ahead inside, and I'll show you the features of the room. The building material, these walls, that was used while this building was under construction was uh, recycled building material. All of the wood that you see, the doors, the frames, for all the furniture, these are all made out of farmed wood. It comes from trees that were planted and grown on special farms uh, with the sole purpose of becoming furniture. So basically, the, no forests were affected by the creation of these furnitures. All of the lighting in these rooms, in all of our room categories, are 100% LEDs. Not only in the guest rooms, but also in all the public areas throughout the whole property. Features in our bathrooms and our showers 
basically all of our faucets and our shower heads um, they're all low flow shower heads and we have aerators installed in all of our faucets so actually the amount of water that is actually coming out you can see there's a full flow of water but it's actually about 70 percent air a person that spend a week here will probably leave a, a smaller footprint than if they would have stayed at home and uh, polluted uh, the area with their three cars, their fully air-conditioned house, and the meals at McDonald's and Burger King. When they stay with us, they feel that they are helping the environment by staying in a property that is fully, fully green. Our guests love to hear that we care about the environment. They come to Grenada for this beautiful environment you see all around us. And so it's our, it's our duty and our responsibility to continue to keep it as green and as fresh as ever so that all of the guests who want to come back can keep coming back for years to come. We have a lot of ponds like these and um, this is one of our main checks for our mosquito control. Um, what we used to do, like most other properties around the Caribbean, is we used to fog once a week. And we found that to be somewhat ineffective. The mosquitoes would fly away and come back as soon as the fogging was done. It was time for a paradigm shift. So we hired a biological control expert to come and do a full audit of the property and give us her findings. Um, what we found was that the mosquitoes we have are very localized. They have about a 50 meter radius from their breeding to biting. And so if we could control all of the stagnant water around our property and not allow them to breed and grow, then we would be able to dr dramatically control the mosquito population here. This is good, at, good right now because we've got fish and it's got the snails. So the mosquito larvae will not survive long enough to reproduce. We have a mosquito controller who goes around every day for two to three hours a day looking for stagnant water. We don't allow any standing water, any stagnant water on the property that can breed mosquitoes. Since we started doing this, we've seen a roughly 80% decrease in our mosquito decline. The guests have noticed it, we have noticed it. Um, it's the right way to go. We've been um, farming this technique out to other properties, helping them develop the same um, methods, and they've also seen dramatic results. So I think it's the way forward in the Caribbean, and uh, we do hope that everyone ad adopts this technique. Organic. You dig the hole, put the organic down, then put the plant sitting on top. Then cover him back, water him, get big like this now, and then there also be a lot of fruits. So everything we grow is for the guests. Local for the guests. And this idea comes from my boss. He was thinking about eat healthy. And I could see a difference in the family that no skin disease from the chemical cause problem. So I'll uh, go to organic. I give my boss thumbs up to see that he bring that idea up. And all the workers in the hotel is using it right now, organic. The common misconception is that you cannot be a luxury five-star resort and be energy conscious at the same time. However, what we have found is that we can provide our guests with the top of the line technology, top of the line products that give them a a wonderful guest experience and also save us money. We decided that it would be cost effective and intelligent to invest in things like solar heating for our hot water units, energy efficient air conditioning units, LED lighting. And the more we invested in this and the more we started to, and to investigate, we found that the savings were just increasing exponentially. So we really decided to run with it. We insulated our rooms. We use our wastewater to water the plants. We have our nursery, which also we can also use the wastewater for. It uses rainwater for that as well. We use our guttering around the rooms to capture the rainwater and water the plants as well. So um, all of these features together really do add up. So these are an example of some of our brand new, much more efficient units. Um, they are inverter units, so what they do is they have internal thermostat, they read the temperature of the room, and once it's reached a, a desired temperature, it then works minimally to maintain that temperature. 
I couldn't tell you the exact benefit of one air conditioning unit, but I can tell you that um, this year we've installed 10 and I can see, I can tell you that we've seen the cost this year per room of keeping each room cool has dropped significantly. So overall, in the long run, you see dramatic results. The Ridgeways Hawk is a raptor that's endemic to Hispaniola um, and we estimate there's between 300 and 450 individuals left in the world and it's one of the most critically endangered raptors. The only population that we know of right now is in a, a Los Aitises National Park which is in the northeastern part of the country and if something were to occur such as a hurricane or disease or a large fire um, it could essentially wipe out the entire population or a large part of it. So part of the work that we're doing is uh, creating additional populations in other protected areas around the island. Um, and Punta Cana is one of our most important release sites. What we do is we take several chicks from the wild population, we bring them here to Punta Cana, we raise them in a lab until they're about 30 to 35 days old, and then we move them to an area that we call a hack site, which is essentially an aviary high up on a platform in the forest and they spend about a week to 10 days inside the aviary, which allows them to become comfortable with the, their surroundings, um, all the noises, all the sights, everything they're gonna uh, be seeing once they're out of the, their aviary. They get fed there, it kind of becomes their uh, surrogate nest. And after 10 days or so, we open up the doors and the birds are then free flying. Um, but it usually takes them about three months until they become independent, which means we still continue to provide food for them on a daily basis. Little by little, they'll begin to learn to hunt on their own. And after about three months, they're hunting perfectly without us and they disperse to other areas and no longer need to come back to the hack site to feed. Now we're in an area of Punta Cana called Los Arecifes. And just a few meters down the road is where we have the second pair of Ridgeways hawks that uh, formed from the birds that we've released here in the area. And this year, it seems like we're gonna have up to between seven and 10 pairs um, of hawks in the area. So it's really been a huge success to see how fast the hawks can pair up um, and find each other. And we're hoping that after a few more years of releasing here, we'll have a self-sustainable population where um, you know, we'll have a number of pairs that are breeding successfully and expanding the population on their own. And then we'll move to other areas in Dominican Republic, other protected areas where we can continue this project as well. This is the wind farm of Father Pete. Uh, this uh, particular location um, produces about 20% of the island need for electricity. This is a, a government initiative and it's financed by a, a, a manufacturer of wind turbines out of Holland. There will be a total production of about 50% of the total consumption of uh, Ruba. The other part will uh, then be gained through the uh, solar park at the airport and other parks that uh, we, will, we will visit throughout the island. We have set out the goal uh, to become totally sustainable in the area of energy by 2020. Uh, we already are almost at 30% of our total capacity based on renewable energy. It's ideal for both wind and solar and uh, we hope that we get to eventually get 100% of the island's necessity uh, through, um, through these two sources of energy. Of course it does two things. One, uh, no more burning of fossil fuels. And of course, no more exporting of precious uh, uh, funds for the island uh, to buy um, uh, fuel or oil uh, in Venezuela or in Saudi Arabia or wherever it comes from. I think a lot of Caribbean islands have the same attributes Aruba has. There is lots of sun, there's lots of wind, and I think everybody would benefit from, uh, from these sources of energy rather than uh, importing oil and burning fossil fuels and creating all that pollution. Grupo Bundacana has been an innovator, I think, from its inception because, I mean, first and foremost, there's very few resorts that own and operate an international airport, especially one as big and as successful as ours. 
Um, it's one of the busiest airports in the Caribbean. It started out as this little tiny runway um, that you know they used to have to fly over several times to get the goats off the runway, and then now you know on a Saturday they're getting over 120 flights on one day. We started with a small terminal, only had the capacity for 100 people, and instead of us putting air condition, we did it open. What we did, high roof, there were no walls, and that way we can have the crosswind. So that way we don't have to be air condition, and that way we protect it, and that way we save money. And at the end of the day, everybody won. We use less energy, we save money, and people feel they're arriving to a great tourist airport. And today is a, it's a very local airport with local flavor, with local heart, and anyone that comes here, you'll say, wow, what an airport. You don't feel you're in Frankfurt, you don't feel that you're in New York, you don't feel you're in Miami. You feel you are in the Caribbean. In the 90s, early 90s, we created a waste program to control all the waste and all the trash that came in the planes to Punta Cana Airport. And we collect all the garbage that comes from the planes and we classify it. The thing that we can burn, we take it to a biomass plant and we burn it. We have a laundry company and we produce it right away, the vapor for the laundry. And then we save tons of money and tons of gallons of fuel oil not to be burned. So at the end of the day, the airport won, our laundry company won, and the environment won. And it was a very easy project, just I needed heart and soul to be made possible. We're achieving a 50% recycling rate at this uh, current time, and uh, we hope to achieve a zero waste initiative. We're operating three separate balers. Each baler is dedicated to a different kind of material. Um, these materials are cardboard, paper, and plastics and also aluminum. So when we um, achieve enough volume, then we initiate the compacting process and create a bale, which is then exported to uh, markets for uh, reuse. All this waste is generated in Punta Cana Zone in Punta Cana International Airport. So when I say Punta Cana Zone, it includes the, uh, the residential areas, the hotels here within a geographical area of about 12 kilometers. And uh, that's how the, the waste is uh, managed and then brought to this location for us to try, try to uh, minimize the impact on the environment. Um, and so we're not zero waste, you know, this is like an ongoing thing, but I'm fairly proud that we've, you know, come a long way. We've implemented a pretty large scale project. We've presented this um, at universities in the uh, United States. We have a regular flow of visitors, of universities, of companies, of uh, consultants and interested government officials coming to our recycling plant, seeing what we're doing, how we're doing it. Um, but I think the, the most you know, point of pride we can take is that other people are seeing value in what we're doing and are, and are trying to adapt some of what we've learned and some of our experience to their own situations. Belmont Estate is one of the oldest plantations on the island dating back to the, the 1600s and um, it has you know evolved through this whole you know plantation system from you know French owners to to Scottish owners to English owners until it was owned by the Nag family in 1944 the first Grenadian family that has owned the estate and over the years has employed thousands of people right now we, you know we have about 80 staff and uh, full time and we uh, sometimes have um, persons who work here part time as well it's very much a, a live functioning working plantation and cocoa it's our number one crop and nutmegs of course and uh, various other spices fruits and vegetables herbs anything that you can eat that can grow in Grenada is here we have uh, silver oranges orange uh, grapefruit avocados pea guavas sweet potatoes plantains mangoes Lots of cocoa, Coconuts, lots, of lots of cocoa, and, lots of and of nutmegs, cocoa. and spices. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>
We focus on cooking and preparing food that is local and that is authentic so that uh, people who come here to the restaurant are going to experience uh, eating food that we normally prepare at home. Of course, we do take um, our food preparation to another level and we may have some things that are slightly gourmet, but using the natural food that we produce here. We do pies and casseroles and all kinds of different concoctions of things with the ground vegetables as well. And we make soups and we make drinks with them. We want people to see how versatile these foods are as well. We're just known to prepare them in a particular way you know, like potato that you can make in so many different ways. So you can do with breadfruit and bananas and plantains and sweet potatoes and cassava. It's important for guests to understand um, the purity and the naturalness of the food that we prepare, the food that we grow, and that when they are here, they have the confidence that they're eating um, food directly from the estate or from farmers that we trust. Um, we started the agritourism component in 2002 and it gives the guests an opportunity to observe and to participate in farming activities while at the same time you know enjoying something um, that is special and unique and um, different from the sea, sun, sand and experience that um, guests are are used to having in, in these islands. We're having a little rain which I'm so happy about because it's dry season and I have plants that really need that rain. Oh, look at this! It is a very rich experience because people come to understand um, the culture of a community or a society. They come to understand how people live. I mean, farming is one of the core activities that we are involved in here on the island and it um, gives guests a, a first-hand close-up uh, um, look at our lives and our, um, our involvement in farming. Um, what I have come to see, for instance, that most people who know chocolate, because we all know chocolate, are so amazed when they see a cocoa pod and come to realize that this is where chocolate starts. And for me, that's, you know, it's very exciting to be able to explain that whole metamorphosis from cocoa pod, you know, to, to chocolate and to get people to really um, get a better appreciation for the love and the hard work that goes into that transformation process to, to create that you know, chocolate delight. Belmont Estate is also home to the Goat Dairy Project, a non-profit farm-to-table enterprise that provides high-quality goat cheeses to Grenada's shops, restaurants and hotels. It's dedicated to teaching sustainable goat dairy management to local farmers and to the enthusiastic children of St. Patrick's Anglican Public School. We have 22 goats, 12 female, 2 male and 8 kids. They all have names and dates of birth. This here is the milking stand where we milk the goats so the milk we use the milk to make cheese. And the children have the opportunity to get hands-on experience about how to care for animals, how to care for plants, and how it all works together from seed to table. It's a, it's a wonderful opportunity for um, them. And um, it's about life skills for long-term sustainability for their families and for the community. We work in harmony with the environment. All of our goats have names. We have uh, records on all of them. We know exactly who is bred to who. We know the offspring. Uh, we know their birth dates. We know who was milked each day. When you buy a package of our um, finished cheese that has a batch number on it, we can tell you from that batch number exactly whose milk was used for that um, batch of cheese. A lot of the tour guides have been incorporating uh, the goat dairy into their tours already, but we're going to, we're actually very excited because we are going to be doing uh, specific tours for the goat dairy alone. The price is higher when you do things here, and it costs a lot more money to do what we're doing, but it's all hand done. We can guarantee you that there's not extra hormones in the milk, there's not uh, antibiotics, it's pure, it's natural. We can tell you uh, what they've been feeding on, 
Uh, it hasn't had chemicals, it hasn't had herbicides, pesticides added to it. Um, these links are really, really important um, for health and for the security of, uh, of an island and uh, really anywhere in the world, people need to know where their food comes from. Kariaku, population about 6,000, is one of three islands that make up Grenada. Tourism, its biggest business, is small-scale, low-key and friendly. Good morning, welcome to Karaku. I'm Allison. nice to meet you. I want them to see life the way, like the way we live it, like from our eyes, you know? So for the few hours that you're with me, I want you to be a local person, to have a total local experience. I don't come here to hang out with a bunch of tourists or, or Americans or white Americans, white Europeans, uh, because I do that all the time. So I like to interact and learn from the local culture. Authentic means going to local rum shops. Authentic means interacting with locals in the country that are not serving tourists, that are not part of the tourist scene. Uh, and uh, an authentic also means where we are here. Take a look at the water and the island and the nature. This is authentic as it comes. I love what I do because of the interaction. Every day I get to meet different people. You know, and for the couple of hours, just interact with them, hear their story, share my story. I just love that. I go to places that are usually not on the normal, you know, tourist route. I want them to meet other local people and see exactly how it is that we live. We're definitely trying to have everything locally done here. Most of it, most of the products are designed by us or by people that work with us very close. In the jewelry, uh, we try to reflect the Caribbeans in the colors, of course. In the Serum de Caraiba, our natural body line, we try to use as much fragrance, oils, um, raw materials here in Grenada, Cariacu. Where do you get the beads? Um, All around? Yeah. All around. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The Caracol Music Foundation was founded in 2012. The other directors and I thought it was important to have more activities on the island to keep the children busy and to also teach them a skill that they can use in the future. We get lots of instruments donated to us. We have a good turnout at our quarterly um, fundraising events. The teachers are all volunteers, so they don't charge to teach, so we don't charge the students to learn. Can you hear something what you remember? I offer a local meal, a home-cooked meal, try to exceed their expectations. All of the products we use are from Caracu. I try to buy things from the local farmers or from the marketing board, which are all produced and grown in Grenada. You have some lamb baked chicken, your potato has on it a carrot, garlic, tomato and pepper topping, fried plantains, some pumpkin and a salad. Whoa. I've had great meals on her trips. Oh my gosh. Bon appetito. Bon <laughs> punch. Thank you, Allison. Thank you, Allison. Fabulous. This is great. Yes. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. The view is stupendous. It is? Yeah. No phone, no iPhones, no computers. It's a non-technology moment. Yeah, at the moment it is. Yeah. Don't you feel like Robinson Crusoe a bit? Well, I do. I also think it's important too to hire people, train them, and compensate them well. And I take pride in the fact that I do that. I want the people that work for me and with me to earn a good living so that they can take care of their own families. What I'm trying to accomplish is to show other women, other women on the island, that you can do it. You just have to go in and make it happen and to set the example that you can think out of the box and be successful at it. And I think that's what I'm most proud of.
Hello, welcome to Greatest. My name is Laura Ann and I'm one of the managers of this fabulous property. Great Huts is a rustic resort that has a jungle themed setting and everything that's here, the design and the artwork, really seeks to pay homage to our African ancestors, art and culture. Great Huts has, is, is a wonderful exhibition of artwork and so we feature art from various um, popular artists, for example, Nakazi, we have Her Faces and Masks by Jean Pearson. In addition to that, the African Sunrise has a painting on the wall that depicts, um, you know, the slaves and what they went through and just the, um, the slave trade, the slave triangle. And, and we also feature uh, woodwork. Uh, our furniture is made by Mr. Nicely, a world-renowned or an island-wide renowned um, master woodworker. And you know, because we want to support local persons, we get them all from persons who are either in our immediate surroundings or from Kingston or somewhere else in the island. So we also get our produce locally. So our vegetables, we purchase them from the, someone at the Port Antonio market. Our fish and our seafood or lobster is freshly caught. We catch it from Mr. Roy as he goes by. We're big on culture, not just with the art, but we do have um, a culture show, cultural show that we offer to guests every Saturday night. So it's a live local entertainment. <laughs> And this show is done by students from the local mansioning group that is just up the road, it's in the parish of uh, Portland. And it happens on our safari deck, which is in the dining room, and so it gives that wow feeling, that authentic feeling like you're, you're in the jungle and you're a part of everything that's going on. We have 17 units, so we are a boutique property. But the reality is we could not do what we do without our staff, and so they are vital and very important for us. It's the first time for us to be here in the Great Huts, <laughs> and we really enjoyed the sleep in the treehouse, and it was a great experience. Yeah, and in the morning you hear the birds, and it was really great, and when the rain falls down, everything is so soundy, and yeah, the beach is great, cliffs, yeah. Everything was so nice. I think a lot of people are looking for hotels that are not part of the big chains. And this really affords an opportunity to explore a country in a different way. It's an immersion into a culture that doesn't happen in many places. We want it to be a meaningful vacation where they come to Jamaica, they enjoy the Jamaican roots and all that Jamaica has to offer, but then they're taking back a piece of what we are and where we're coming from. And it just makes the experience so much more valuable to them and so much more memorable. I haven't been there, but I heard about it, but that sounds 150% my type of thing, what I would really love, I'm sure. And, and it's not something that needs hundreds of millions of dollars to be done in huge, you know, huge amounts of uh, money to be invested and things like that. It could be done on a smaller, more simple base, bring employment to the, the people locally. I think that's, that's the thing which is most sadly lacking in Jamaica, is that not enough entrepreneurs, people are entrepreneurs, who are able to access the cash flow that comes from tourism. My wife and I bought the property in uh, 1998 um, and uh, at the time it was a seven room uh, inn. We've now, we've now built it up over the years to uh, it's got 50 rooms. When we first bought the place our objective was to um, you know settle into Grenada and, uh, and, and make a living and we realized that actually you know making lots of money is not a particularly good aim in life and uh, uh, we started putting a lot of energies towards other other issues social issues and environmental issues and then along came Ivan which sort of blew the, the hotel away
Hurricane Ivan strikes Grenada with winds exceeding 150 miles per hour. Destruction is widespread, including the True Blue Bay Resort and a nearby primary school. Uh, so our, our focus at that time was to rebuild the hotel and get our livelihood and the livelihood of our staff back in, in, uh, in action. Uh, social responsibility comes easy. I mean, you know, I think all corporations have a social responsibility, first of all to the staff and secondly to the, to the community. We chose to help a school that um, a lot of our staff sent their kids to, which was Vendum School. And when I got there, I realised that it, they were actually being educated in an old Quonset hut that was uh, in the summer times hot, hot, hot. And uh, when it rained, it was noisy. And when you had uh, 50, 60, 70 kids in there all shouting and talking, it was uh, an echo chamber. It was an unbelievably poor environment for educating children. There was a building uh, behind this Quonset hut. It was going to cost a quarter million dollars to, uh, to refurbish it. Uh, and with the help of the local power company and uh, some other charitable um, organisations, we, we raised the money and uh, built them a really, really beautiful school. And a lot of the donations came from our guests. Um, uh, Travellers Philanthropy works really well. They, um, some of them were phenomenally generous. I mean, we had guests that we would write out cheques for two, three, four thousand uh, dollars. We send out uh, letters to our guests prior to their arrival. We talk about it when they arrive here. And we actually put on their bill uh, an extra dollar a day to go towards Vendham School, which is a voluntary contribution. Um, and we have, nobody ever objects to that donation. And it's a simple dollar a day and our staff talk to the, to the guests about uh, what we're doing, they show them photographs. And uh, the repeat guests bring back books, bring back clothes, bring back shoes and donate cash. So it, it, it and do you know, the guests get a lot, a big buzz out of that. They, it involves them in the community. They feel like they've, they've come to Grenada, not just for a holiday, but they've come actually to do something good. So it's a feel good situation for them as well. Everybody can do a little bit and here they actually go out and say, you know, this is what we're doing. This is our uh, Vendum uh, RC Primary School fundraiser thermometer. I think we're actually a little bit higher than the 27,000 it shows there now. So uh, you can see it's a very successful fundraising project. We've recently just completed a library at the school and they've got a, this beautiful library. Uh, uh, Hands Across the Sea helped us uh, uh, supply the books. A local company provided us with the AC for the room, so it's the first um, AC library probably in the country. And the kids are all eager to read and to do projects, etc. Our enrollment has increased. We had 52, as I said, now we have 98. There's still lots of things that need to be done, you know, as it comes in a very, very poor community. So uh, we plan to continue assisting the school whenever we can. And as I said before, you know, I think we've got a lot out of it. Certainly the staff have got a lot out of it and a lot of enthusiasm for raising money for the school. Um, and, uh, and we've become good friends with them. Six, Six yes, exactly. No. We've got about four or five of our staff now actually were educated at um, Vendum School and they're now working for us either part-time or full-time. I do not have words to express the way the staff and the community feels about what Mr. Ross is doing. Once you have children or persons who are educated, we will be able to do better in every aspect of life. <laughs>